doesn't even exist, Lyme disease. But yet, there's documentation that goes back to the late 1800s. I've been shown by our special guest tonight, Dr. Christopher Husser, who has researched this. And there is, in fact, such a thing as Lyme disease. And there is, in fact, a good reason for concern. And it does need to be recognized, talked about, and that's what we're going to do tonight, is talk about Lyme disease. Dr. Husser, thank you so much for being on the show tonight. You're welcome, sir. And guts, I guess, for lack of a better word, to come forward and recognize something that's been written about for years and years and years. That's true. How, what what is? And I know it's a hard question. It's what exactly is Lyme disease? Lyme disease, by definition, is an infectious disease caused by a type of bacteria called a spirochete, and this is very similar to the spirochete that causes syphilis. It has a circular motion, it's actually like a worm, and Lyme disease itself is responsible for an incredible amount of pathology. In particular, it likes to affect the neurological system, the brain and the nervous system, the heart, cardiovascular system, and the musculoskeletal joint system, or all three. On well, that's just about brains. everything we've got. Isn't that? How did That's you true. get involved in, I mean, what got you going on Lyme disease? And to it's uh, funny how the universe puts mentors in your way when you're supposed to come and learn. Right. I was back in Michigan and I was very interested in multiple sclerosis because the neurological profession has no known idea what causes multiple sclerosis. We know it's a demyelinating disorder, which means the myelin insulation is stripped off nerve sheaths. And, and so I was interested, I was a former dentist, I thought maybe there was a mercury component to this demyelination factor, and I was started to do some research in it. And I was introduced to my mentor, and I have to give, you have to give your mentors credit, Dr. Lida Matman, and she's a Nobel laureate, and her expertise is in bacteria that can evade the immune system. They're called cell wall deficient bugs. And in fact, this is her book. This is one of several books she wrote, Subwall Deficient Forms, for those of you that are interested. And she talks about many, many types of organisms that can literally shed their cell wall and disguise themselves from the immune system. And that's basically what we're seeing with Lyme disease. The immune system doesn't recognize this button and it grows unchecked inside people's bodies. How Lyme bodies. disease got here, nobody quite knows. I mean, there's different theories. And in some of these books, it talks about being a relatively new disease or an old disease. If you go back in some of the literature that I gave you, in the, at the turn of the, um, the Revolutionary War, there was several articles written about British soldiers that had these arthritides that were quartered in the New England, uh, New England area. Some of the research, uh, they went into some of the museums and did RNA, DNA research with mice in the museums and they found that these mice were infected at least with some of these strains back 200 years ago at the, when our, when our country was founded. That goes back to your original question, how come this isn't showing up as a major issue? Right. Because the laboratory testing is not sensitive enough. And that's why many, many patients who are indeed positive for Lyme's have cl clinical symptoms, are misdiagnosed, they go to, they get their blood drawn, they get sent to the laboratory, and the laboratory says, you don't have Lyme's, and so we end up treating pieces of paper, not the patient who is symptomatic, and we should be treating them, or at least have a suspicion. Right. So, I would like to read just the short list of symptoms. That's three pages, I think. Well, I know, but I'm not going to read them all. But when I read this for the first time, a checklist of current, current system. Symptoms. Persistent swollen glands, sore throat, fevers, sore soles, especially in the morning. Joint pain, and this is just about all, all your joints. Joint swelling, and this is all your joints. Unexplained back pain. Stiffness in the joints or back. Muscle pain or cramps. Obvious muscle weakness. Twitching in the face and other muscles. Confusion. Difficulty thinking. Difficulty with concentration, reading, problem absorbing, uh, information absorbing. Word search, name block. In other words, you can't bring a, a name of somebody right up. Forgetfulness, poor short-term memory, poor attention. Disorientation, getting lost, going to wrong places. 
speech errors, wrong word, misspeaking, mood springs, irritability, depression, anxiety, panic attacks, psychosis, uh, hallucinations and delusions, uh, tremors, seizures, headache, light sensitivity, sound sensitivity, vision, double vision, That's only one page, and I'm not going to go through both pages. If you want it, give me a call. Or How do you kill this little bugger? Good question. The best time to That's kill... That's a wrong answer. That's Dr. about the best Hunter. one I have for you, sir. <laughs> the best time for a cure is right away if you know you've gotten stung or bit, I should say, by a tick. And these ticks, I don't know if you can focus on this. Here's what these ticks look like. Here's the four stages of a tick. This is the nymph, and then they get larger, and this is the adult form, and then this is the adult tick that has become blood engorged. And they swell to like 10 times their size or, or more, and then they get so engorged with blood they drop off. But they have a very sharp proboscis, looks like a chainsaw, and they actually embed it in your skin, and they lock themselves in, and they regurgitate digestive contents which are infected with this bug. That's how they infect you in these things. Well, there was somebody that told me that uh, this is a, now listed as a communicable disease, which to me says I could get it from somebody else. And you're right. Apparently, I have seen women give this to children through childbirth, through placental transfer. And indeed, this may be a cause of some of the autism. There's been some papers written on that. This might be a, at least a contributing source to autism whereas a mother, unbeknownst that she has the disease process, gives it to the children. I've been at seminars before where doctors have showed slides of semen with, that were full of the beryllial organisms, beryllial organisms so that every time the, the couple had sexual relations, he was giving her a dose of, of beryllia. So it, it would just almost seem to me, from the list of symptoms and what you've just said, that this is... <laughs> This is not isolated cases. Oh, no. This, this is, is almost, I, I stopped short at saying virtually everybody, but everybody has a lot of these symptoms that I've talked to. You bet, and a lot of people have this disease process. Where do I start? What do I do? You need to find a Lyme literate doctor. You're the only one that I know. And there's not very many of us, and the system has tried to remove us from doing this kind of work. <laughs> Letting, curing people? Well, I'm going to bring up a couple cases here. This tape, that the CD that I gave you, this is called Lyme Disease Association Presents, and it's a great review, and it's by Dr. Joseph Burriscano, who is an MD in New York. Mm -hmm. And this gentleman has been at this for almost 20 years. He's very Lyme's literate. He sees patients from all over the world. The New York State Medical Boards tried to shut him down and saying he's overdiagnosed. They tried to take his license. How do you overdiagnose? I don't think you can. So, what's. This is probably the wrong thing to ask a doctor, but what's wrong with our medical system? What's happened? If you. And I don't um, want to put you on the spot, don't. Well, your, your points are well taken. First of all, the insurance companies, I think, realize that this is of epidemic proportions. And there's some literature to that effect. If that's the case, and these patients or people like you and I need to be treated with heavy medications because of neurological problems, that would probably take the insurance companies bankrupt. So once you start showing up on a list, a heading somewhere saying, this doctor likes to do a lot of Lyme's testing and he has positive tests and he's writing prescriptions, it's easier to report you to a medical board and to get you out of the picture. They take your license away rather than help people. Follow the money. Now, medical legally, this book is one of the best books I read on that. This is by Dr. Brian Fallon, forward by Dr. Brian Fallon and Marcus Cohen. Dr. Fallon is a psychiatrist in the New England area that sees a lot, a lot of Lyme's patients with mm -hmm. neuropsychiatric problems. Mm -hmm. And he says you can't overtreat neurological limes, which means IV antibiotics, oral antibiotics, everything you can possibly think of to throw at the patient, them. and just to make them survive. And sometimes you can help them, and sometimes you can. Sometimes they do die. To be what I've found in, in all the different shows that we've done is that it's time to go to 
the cause, not the symptom. But you have to find the right cause. Any disease is like that. Once you find the cause, the treatment usually is a lot easier because you find the cause of the disease. Right. And that's what I was taught as, a, as, a, as an osteopathic physician. Find the cause and treat it. Yeah. Don't treat symptoms. <laughs> this symptom complex, and so if you fit into the symptom complex pattern, then you're taught to treat with certain medications from the pharmaceutical industry. So how many people with this presentation are on medications that probably cost them two, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars a month that are being mistreated or misdiagnosed and treated for things they really don't have when in reality they have an infectious disease and should be on some type of antimicrobial agent mm -hmm. and or immune enhancing thing and a diet and clean, cleaning their, their life up and all that. Right. Is this the fault of the pharmaceutical companies? I can't tell you who the fault is. I mean, has it, has well, it's, it's evolved to this anyway. That the doctors are, and I know that they're taught if this, if they have a set of symptoms, this drug. You have to understand that the pharmaceutical industry paid for a lot of my education. They 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 underwrite a lot of the medical school educations, with grants and what have you. So, my opinion, I think it's very wrong. And you're right. Well, I, I don't know. I just know that we've got some something going on here that is very questionable. Not just Lyme's disease, but the whole system. You're right. You know, you're, you're one of my good friends, and you might as well know this. Dr. Hustler is a very good friend. And he's actually, I, I think you're risking your license by being honest, and I hope not. I don't care anymore. That's sad, because you are a healer. Then if that's the case, I'll be protected in doing this. Right, okay. Uh, mm -hmm.